we've, uh, I think, done about five or maybe even six videos, counting the extra bits, in this area of information theory and a little bit of coding theory. And we got to a reasonably good um, state with this, but the story needs finishing off. So I'd like to finish off the story and go back to our old example of San Francisco weather states. I'll try and make this completely understandable in a freestanding way, but if you do get a bit lost, go to the playlist and just catch up with the bits and pieces that you're not quite sure about. What we've done here is split them up into four good codes that are meaningful and four bad ones. We've been working for ages now with this <laughs> very accurate model of San Francisco weather, that it's either foggy, sunny, cloudy or rainy, and you get about 25% of each of those states, so the probability is a quarter. It's a two-bit code. Foggy, zero, zero. Sunny, zero, one. Cloudy, one, zero. Rainy, one, one. Fine. Four states, four different bit patterns, two bits needed. What we, I think, then did right at the very end was this. What happens if you get a disturbance, electrical disturbance on the line, which either turns a zero into a one or a one into a zero? Now, this is a good stage at which to say something which I've never actually emphasized before. We're assuming what Claude Shannon calls a symmetric channel. In other words, there is a, if a bit gets clobbered, it could be a zero turning into a one, or it could be a one turning into a zero, but if that happens, it's equally probable either way. In other words, there's nothing about a one bit that makes it different from a zero bit in terms of its noise immunity. So it's a binary symmetric channel. We said, all right, letters. Add a third bit to these two-bit codes and let us keep what's called the overall parity even. In other words, there must be an even number of ones. So here we go, look. What could you add to two zeros as a third bit on the right and still keep it even parity? Well, it's even parity already, so you can add a zero. If you send three bits, then so long as they arrive looking like one of these patterns, that's fine. But then you get things like, oh, well, suppose at Sacramento they get 0, 1, 0. That's not one of these four. So what does 0, 1, 0 tell you? Well, it tells you that something went wrong because it's not in the allowed set. But the problem is there's no end of ways that 0, 1, 0 could have arisen. So you can detect, but you can't correct. Then we got on to talking about how would Sacramento say, back to San Francisco, I got it, I love it, or not acknowledge, I don't like it, it's a bad code. So we invented ack and knack, back from Sacramento to San Francisco. And then you go through the same argument. Finally, we said, what do we have to do to make a one-bit error be correctable? And this ack and knack got us started famously, and we're going to carry this story on today. We drew a cube, and we decorated around its vertices, its corners, with all the possible three-bit combinations. But I carefully arranged so that the three zeros, which I'm now using for ack, three ones as knack, I put them at the diametrically opposite corners of the cube. And what is magic about doing that is that if there is a one error corruption of the code, you can correct it because it is so close, its nearest neighbor matching of the bad code against what it must have been. So what we've discovered then is that in three bits, you can have two so-called code words, bit patterns, which are correctable as well as detectable, but you can only have two. Nothing else will fit. The remaining corners of the cube are needed to put things right when it goes wrong. This is okay, actually. We've got a nice situation now. You send a message and you wait for the acknowledge or the not acknowledge to come back. So you went out with um, three bit codes for four weather states and Sacramento comes back, either says acknowledge, not acknowledge, but because of this protection, the ack and the knack are gonna get through 99.99999% of the time. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, as a communications protocol, because this is exactly what happens on local area networks. Here we are then. How do we 
say we've got four weather states, but what we'd like to do is not do the ACNAC protocol. We'd like to send them out with sufficient extra bits that the far end, Sacramento, could put it right. Let's assume that San Francisco and Sacramento were miles apart, you know, and you want to transmit it once and have done with it. You don't want repeats. Well, three bits clearly isn't going to be enough. Three bits can accommodate two so-called three-bit code words that are distinguishable from one another, but no more. And your first thought may well be, well, let's try four bits. Now, the number of bits you use in your code strings equates, if you like, to the dimensionality of the cube. And we've gone beyond cube now to hypercube. This is a topologically correct projection of a four-dimensional hypercube onto two-dimensional flat paper. There's lots of ways to depict it. I've always liked this one. I think I saw it in Martin Gardner's Scientific American Recreational Maths column many, many years ago. You draw a cube, and then inside it, you draw another cube, almost sort of suspended in midair inside the original cube. You then connect all of the corresponding corners from the outer cube to the inner cube. I've put those in in this diagram as dots, but the dots don't mean anything. They're just something that makes it easier for me to see the structure. So don't worry about the dots. Every line in here is a projection of an edge in the hypercube. It's got exactly the right topology, but it's been distorted so that you can understand it. So here's your challenge, audience, if you think visually like this. Oh, and by the way, we're going to stop at four dimensions. I have no intention of going to five dimensions when we get up to five bit codes. Four dimensions is enough, but just look at this. The challenge is to say we've got four zeros, four ones, maybe as our two code words still on the outer cube, four bit coding. On the inner cube, can you choose any pair of corners which are not only three apart from each other on the inner cube, but are also three jumps away from the existing code words on the outer cube. Well, if I choose that corner, it's hopeless. It's only one away from existing code word. Even if I choose this one up here, is that any good? No, it's one, two away from here. Choose this one down here. You know, is that one any good down at the lower right? No, it's one, two away. No matter which of the eight corners you choose in that inner cube and try and get them diametrically opposite so maybe you can pack in two more. You just can't do it. You can't even pack in one more because it's always no better than two jumps away from existing code words. In other words, four-dimensional space has letters down big time. But now we go over to a much more, if you like, algebraic bit pattern, computer science way, and we say, we will conjecture. Mathematicians would say this all the time. Even as computer scientists, I conjecture that five bits might be enough to encode four weather states for San Francisco with some sort of protection in it so that far end can correct and cannot need to ask for a retransmit. And this basically is the classic Hamming code. We're going to go against tradition a little bit. You're very used to me putting up a bit pattern, numbering it from the right and saying that's the zero bit, that measures the ones, the twos, and go right to left. For constructing Hamming code, you go left to right. And you start numbering up one, not at zero. OK, what's special about one? Well, in terms of powers of two, it's two to the power zero. I'm sure you will all remember Anything to the power zero is one. Two is no exception. Two to the power zero is one. Two, of course, can be written as two to the power one. Let's just put lines under these. Another exact power of two here, four, is two squared. So what Hamming said was this. Think of your positions that are exact powers of two as being where you put the parity check bits. And then you use the other bits in your pattern to hold all the information bits. And then I will give you a methodology for working out what the parity check bits would be. So instead of adding one parity check bit now, like we did you know, in the three bit codes, we're now going to end up 
adding no fewer than three parity check bits. I will stick to even parity. Nothing special about that. You can do it odd if you want to, but you must be consistent, of course. OK, those are our column headings. What was the state of weather in San Francisco on the left? Uh, the, the first code was zero, 00, if you remember. And I put the information bits of the codes in the 3 and 5 positions, where they are not powers of 2. You've got to remember that bit 1 acts as a checkpoint for the positions 1, 3 and 5. Bit 2 is a check for bit 2 and bit 3. Bit 4 up here, uh, the third parity check bit, that checks 4 and 5. What you're doing is basically breaking down these order numbers into sums of powers of 2. Let's just see if this... I'm taking up too much space with green. Let's see if the blue works here. What I'm pointing out to you is that 3 can be thought of as... 1 plus 2. 5, in terms of sums of powers of 2, can be thought of as 1 plus 4. So this is how it works. You write in your information bits, and then you say, what about my parity bits? And you use these rules here, which effectively says that bits 1, 3 and 5, taken together, must be even. Parity. Well, look, bits 3 and 5, information bits, naught and naught. So if 1 plus 3 plus 5 in parity terms, and of course, a lot of you realise we're doing exclusive ors here of 1s and zeros. 0 and 0, it's even already. So to keep the 3-bit grouping, including 1 even, it needs to be 0. Bit 2 checks 2 and 3, but 3 is already 0. So... 2 plus 3 is parity bits must add up to being even. It's 0 already, so we get another 0. Finally, what about bit 4? Unknown at the moment, it's got to be a parity check. Ah, well, 4 and 5 taken together must form an even parity pair. Oh, that's dead easy. What it's predicted is it's a simple binary repetition code for one of the states. OK, but everything is guided by your information bits. We're now going to move on to 0, 1. Same rule, look. Bit 1 checks 1, 3 and 5. OK, 3 and 5 are in there already. They are data bits. Ah, but there's 1 and a 0 now. And to make the whole thing even parity then, what have I got to do to the 1 bit? Make it a 1, because 1 and 1 give you even parity. And then check out bit 2. Bit 2 combined with bit 3 must give an even parity combination. Well, bit 3 is in there as a 0. So 2 combined with 3, you've got to have a 0. And then finally, bit 4. Well, 4 and 5 taken together must form an even parity combination. So therefore, if 5 is 1, then sorry folks, 4 has got to be 1. The next information Code I put in there, which my notes say is the cloudy code, 1 and 0. Here we go again. 1, 3 and 5 taken together must form an even parity combination, but you've got a 1 there and a 0 there, so you need a 1 here to balance it off. Got an even number of 1s, right? And then bit 2, 2 and 3 taken together, well, 3 is 1. We're stuck with that, it's part of the data, so we put a 1 in here make it even. And then 4 and 5 taken together, so that's a 0. And finally, rainy. Here we go again. So our final bit pattern that we've got to locate in here is 1, 1 for rainy. OK, 1, 3 and 5 taken together must be even. Well, 1 and 1, 3 and 5, that's even. So keep it even by putting a 0 in there. Bit 2 and 3 taken together, well, 3 is a 1, so 2 and 3 taken together, be even parity, must have a 1 there. 4 and 5, that's a 1. So you need another 1 in here to make 4 plus 5. So there we are, folks. Those are our so-called code words for all of the states of weather. Look at them. If you look at foggy and sunny, in how many places do the bit patterns differ? 
0 and 1, that's a difference. 0 and 0, no, that matches, that matches. That's different, that's different. Three differences. They're distance three apart. And remember, distance three is magic. We saw that on the cube. If you keep your code words three bits apart from one another, then everything follows absolutely beautifully. And that works fine. But we're now in a situation where we can send all this stuff off to Sacramento and they can blooming well sort it out for themselves. So long as you don't get more than one error in that, then fine, you can correct it by using these Hamming codes. And you say, well, how do you correct it? Well, the answer to that is you do various simple exclusive OR operations on these parity check bits at the power of two positions, you know, like the one, two and four position. You use various combinations of those very much along the lines of how we encoded it in the first place. And depending on the outcome of those, you'll find that some of them check out all right. Yes, it's, it is even. Some of them are bad and wrong and it's odd. And by combining the start positions for the odd ones that are bad, you can uniquely home in on the bit that's gone wrong. And if you want to know more about that, just write in and ask Sean and we'll see what we can do. B had a length of two, H has a length of one, so H has a distance of three. B is done, right? We've done B, we, we can count that as, as, as done. So C next, right? So we're here, we can't go to S, we can only go to L. That's a nice 